This lecture will be on how to write and how to organize your persuasive speech. This is very similar to the Aristotelian outline for informative. The only difference is that for the informative, you're basically you're, you're, you're basing the structure of your speech on the topic itself. For persuasive speaking, we use a very specific format called problem, cause, solution. All persuasive speeches for this assignment must follow the problem, cause, solution format. Okay? No exceptions. When you watch the NFA final round videos, uh, they might sometimes those videos kind of invert the cause and the problem, but basically they follow the same structure. So all of your speeches should follow the same structure. So as I talked about in my last video, first of all, you have to have an introduction. Right? Introduction is pretty much the same. The structural elements of the introduction are the same. But one thing to realize with this is that for persuasive speaking, a majority of speeches start off with a story. So that's a very good, very clean, very easy way to give us insight into your topic is to start off with a story about that topic. Right? Because we need to know very from the very beginning of this performance, the very beginning of the speech, that this is a problem. And that's what this speech is all about. It's all about identifying a problem, telling us where it comes from, and then giving us a solution for it. Significant statement is also important. Why is this important? Why should we listen to this? Sometimes more so than informative, because informative, if you're doing a speech on, say, the like African gray parrot, they're interesting, but it's probably not going to have a significant effect on our lives. But if you choose a very good persuasive topic, it could have an effect on our life. And don't forget your significant statement must have a source. And if you tell a story here, that's also a source. So you can have two or three sources knocked out in the very beginning of your speech. Thesis is also a little bit different. In your informative, like I said, it could be similar to a topic sentence. Today I'm going to talk to you about this. Persuasive speech needs to be very specific and very clear. What are you attempting to do? This speech is to get you to start to use sunblock. This speech is to protect you from the flu. Something along those lines. It doesn't have to be that simple, but it's that concept of in one sentence, hopefully you can do it in one sentence, what exactly is it you're persuading us to do? Preview is the same. What are your three main points? The only difference between informative and persuasive in terms of the preview is that for the informative, you, you, you write your own main points. For this, it's written for you. So you could say, First, I'll identify the problems associated with the topic, then the causes of this topic, and then the solutions. So let's get into it. The first main point, and all of your speeches should have this as your first main point, is the problem. Another way to think of the problem is called the illness. What is this? What's happening? What's, 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 the, what's, what's happening out there? Right? So we need to know. If there's no problem, what are you persuading us to do? So I have people that want to do things like, oh, I want to persuade you that aliens exist. Is there some sort of problem associated with not knowing aliens exist. So when you choose a topic, you're asking yourself, okay, what is this that's out there? Do you, and you want to define and explain it for your audience because if we don't understand it, you're not going to persuade us. You want to establish the problem both qualitatively and quantitatively. So this ties into my other lecture on ethos, pathos, and logos. So qualitative is stories. Tell us stories about people that have been affected by this problem. Quantitative. Tell us, give us the numbers, what percentage, right? So years ago, I had a student who did a speech on escalator safety. And honestly, it wasn't until I saw the speech that I, I didn't know that escalators were such a huge problem. And it was something like 70,000 people each year in the United States alone die or are injured on escalators. So the numbers are there, because that's a pretty significant number. And then he told some stories of people that have been affected by them. Kids that got injured, people that died, people lost body parts on escalators. So those stories affect you. So if I were to do a speech on escalator safety, I would explain escalators are hurting people, blah, 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 blah. Um, here are some stories. Here are some numbers. So then when, when I'm done with that speech on escalator safety, I have that sense of, oh, my gosh, next time I'm around an escalator, I'm going to protect myself. So that's, that's the point of the problem. Now, the cause. The cause is, I just realized I forgot something to put something up for the cause, so I'm going to add that as I'm speaking, because I don't want to start this lecture over. Uh, the cause is where it comes from. Okay, so we have to know what is the direct result of this cause. In cause, we're looking at the concept of what's called inherency. Inherency is what are the problems inherent in the status quo. Status quo is what's going on right now. So what you're telling your audience is what's going on right now that contributes or causes this problem. 
Okay? So if we were to look at escalator safety, so the cause could be maybe the escalators themselves are inherently unsafe. You know, they have sharp edges and things like that. But for most of the causes for escalator issues is that people not paying attention, people getting on with loose shoelaces, messing around, things like that. So we, we have to identify that. So inherency, there are two aspects of adherency. What's called structural inherency. So there's what's called structural inherency and what's called attitudinal inherency. Structural inherency means what are the rules, regulations, and policies that are contributing to this problem. Attitudinal inherency is what are we doing? What, how is our attitude system contributing to this problem? So for me, one of the best examples of this is the, the bathroom sometimes at Valley College. They're much better now, but I remember when I first started teaching here, there were a lot of conversations about how gross some of the bathrooms were. I mean, I'd walk into a bathroom and I'd think, huh, there is a urinal there. Why is there pee on the wall over there? Okay, so what makes for a bad bathroom? In terms of structural inherency, one of our biggest issues that we have is that we just don't have enough money. The state does not give us enough money to have enough custodians to take care of this place all the time. So when the bathrooms aren't being cleaned on a regular basis, it's because of the structure. So the Valley College structure or the infrastructure does not have the money to have custodians go in there on a regular basis. But also attitude. How are we making these bathrooms gross? So when somebody, when there's a urinal here and they pee over here or different things happen, I mean, I'm not gonna get into details, but I've seen some gross things and I've had some students tell me some gross things. And those are people through their attitudes doing those things in the bathroom. Those two things together contribute to the problem. So when, you were, when you've thought about your topic, you have to ask yourself, okay, so what, what, where's it coming from? What are we doing to cause this? And what are doctors or the structure prescribing and that kind of stuff? So speaking of doctors, so, you know, I've had there are a bunch of nurses. I've had speeches on what are called nosocomial, nosocomial infections, which are hospital-acquired infections. It has the numbers. I mean, I've read over 100,000 people die each year from diseases that they acquired in hospitals. Um, that they didn't necessarily go in with. So what's the structure? Well, if the hospital does not have proper cleaning procedures of how they, um, how they clean out, up after people, do they have to quarantine certain people, those sorts of things. So it's that hospital policy that could be contributing to the problem. But also individuals could be contributing to the problem. One student who did a speech on nosocomial infections argued that the two most polluted things in hospitals are doctors, ties, and cell phones. So, because a doctor might, you know, be working with a patient and get some sort of bacteria, something on the tie. Doctor might wash his or her hands and then, you know, go off and touch and then break, but then actually brush the tie. And same thing with phones. You know, we wash our hands on a regular basis, but then we might have a dirty phone, wash our hands so we feel clean, and then pick up the phone and then go work with somebody. So you have to kind of figure out, like, because once you identify the structural elements what we're doing and what the structures are doing, that ties into your solution. How do we solve? How do we, what's our solvency? This is the most important. The biggest grade killer for this assignment is people that don't have solvency. So they might identify a problem. Sometimes they can even say, say where it comes from, but then how do we solve for it? So for example, I've had people, they want to speak on things like capital punishment. Not a good topic because you, you have the problem. If you're for or against capital punishment, you can definitely identify the problem. You can definitely identify a cause. But what is that solution? If I'm for or against capital punishment, or you let's say I'm for it, and then you convince me to be against it, what could I then do tomorrow to solve for the problems you've talked about? Same thing with topics like you know abortion, that kind of stuff. What could I do tomorrow? The best topics are like escalator safety. Tomorrow, I could be more aware of going on an escalator. I could be more aware of my children going on the escalator. So those are the best solutions. So what you want to have for this is you want to have clear and personal steps to solve for this problem. What can I do tomorrow? And I might not. I absolutely might not. There are some topics I think, oh, that's really interesting, um, but it doesn't really affect me. But it's still, there is some solvency out there that maybe I can't do it, but maybe other people can. Okay, the conclusion, the conclusion is very similar to the introduction. Make sure you have your concluding remarks and everything. But again, 
folks, I mean, this, this, this is huge. This is the big problem with this is people just kind of write their own things where they create a, a misconception of what persuasion is for this assignment. You have to identify the problem. Tell us what that problem is. Tell us where the problem comes from. What's the cause of it? Okay, what's, what do we blame it on? And then finally, what's the solution? What is the cure for it? That is the structure that all of your persuasive speeches need.